We start with an important question, the question whether there is a bridge between brain and mind. Is it culture? Wolf Singer has the answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for coming back and joining us. No, I don't have the answer, and um, I will only mention this at the very end of my presentation, as, as all my other speakers. I changed the content several times while I was here in the light of what I have heard. So what I will, what I will try to do is to introduce to you um, a change in the view that uh, took place over the last decade, I think, in considering the brain. We moved from a behaviorist stance that viewed the brain essentially as a stimulus-driven machine with linear dynamics all the way up to considering the brain as a hyper-complex, high-dimensional dynamic system. And this has consequences both for our self-understanding, it has consequences for our view on certain psychiatric diseases, and it will probably have consequences on the design of uh, intelligent machines in the, in the future. And um, so I will elucidate or try at least to comment on this over the next well, yes, it's turned on, it vibrated, it is green, but it doesn't move. Okay, good. So I, I would like to begin with an epistemic caveat that is somehow related to our discussion yesterday on the embedding of mathematics in nature. Um, neurobiologists, of course, know that what we can perceive, imagine, and comprehend must be constrained by the cognitive abilities of our brains because this is our cognitive apparatus. We also know that brains are the product of an evolutionary adaptive process to the mesoscopic part of the world. This is a very small segment of the world in which life has evolved, extending from a few millimeters to meters. And this, uh, compared to the dimensions that we know of, the astrophysics dimension and the, the dimensions in the quantum world is really a tiny little aspect of the world in which brains have evolved in order to bring organisms um, to reproduction. So the likely consequences or the unavoidable consequences are that cognition, because it is the consequence of an adaptive process, is optimized to secure survival in a highly complex, poorly predictable and very insecure world. And this, of course, requires other strategies, other heuristics than the assessment of the hypothetical objective truth. The brain has not been optimized to assess the truth in the, in the Kantian sense. The conclusion from this is that our cognitive abilities are very likely to be highly constrained and idiosyncratic. And there are many examples where one can demonstrate how constructive and idiosyncratic our cognition is. And this probably does not only apply to our perceptual functions, but most likely also generalizes to our way of reasoning. So there is no guarantee a priori that the rules that we deduce from our mesoscopic world and from our reasoning actually can be generalized to the very big and to the very small. And this may be one of the reasons why we have so great difficulties in arriving at a unified picture of the world. So what do we believe? We believe, the neurobiologists believe, that all knowledge that we can have resides in the functional architecture of the brain. So it is stored in the, in the way in which neurons are connected to each other. In the brain, there is no division between storage devices and uh, computing um, compartments. Um, there is no separate storage for wisdom and programs. All we have is neurons and the way in which they are connected. So also the rules and the programs that underlie our cognitive and executive functions, they are predetermined by this architecture. Then we believe, and I think we have good reasons to do so, that all mental functions, even the highest cognitive functions, the mental processes, are the consequence and never the cause of neuronal processes. They follow them. And then we have good reasons to believe that neuronal processes obey the known laws of nature. What is the evidence for these seemingly very bold statements? The evidence is that the behavior of simple organisms is fully accounted for by neuronal processes. And we can find causal evidence for 
the relation between neuronal processes on the one hand and the behavior of these simple organisms on the other. And we see that the neuronal processes that we analyze and that predict behavior, they follow the laws of nature. There's nothing we have to assume in addition, at least not in the moment. Then we know that evolution is conservative. It keeps mechanisms that once have worked out and being successful, they are preserved throughout evolution. And actually, we, because of this, we see no new mechanisms since the emergence of the first vertebrates that have evolved the cerebral cortex. The only change we see since is an increase in complexity by adding more substrate. More of the same makes all the difference. And I skip you the, the graphs that uh, prove that. But we face a serious explanatory gap in the moment. And this is the reason why I think we progress is very slow in the development of new therapeutical approaches to psychiatric diseases. We simply don't understand how these higher cognitive functions and their disturbances come about. It's probably also the reason for the very, very slow progress that we witness in artificial intelligence in constructing intelligent machines. So where is this gap? We know a lot about the brain's hardware, about the neurons, about the circuitry on the one hand, and also because of the non-invasive imaging uh, techniques that we now have that allow measurement of brain activity in human subjects, we know a lot about relations between um, structures and the functions that they subserve. But we by and large ignore how the cognitive and the executive functions actually emerge from the large-scale interactions between the local processes that we have identified. And, and one of the most challenging um, examples of this gap of knowledge is how consciousness emerges from these material processes. And if there's time, I will straddle a little bit to that problem at the very end. What is the neural substrate of the perceiving, deciding, value assigning, intentional self, the brain. Is there a supraordinate center in the brain as our introspection suggests? Because I think we all have this very strong intuition that um, there ought to be a singular center in the brain uh, that takes the initiative that is the seat of the self, the autonomous uh, self that Freud, for example, described. We have a transparency problem. We are not aware of the processes that go on in our brain. Uh, it's as if we look through a transparent uh, medium. Which leads to a striking discrepancy between the first and the third person perspective. Uh, and as you will see in a minute, the brain's intuition about its organization are really in striking conflict with scientific evidence. Because our intuition suggests that there is somewhere in the brain the supraordinate instance that perceives, decides, assigns values, and develops plans for future acts. And we usually equate this instance with the intentional conscious self, at least in psychology, we talk about these things. This has been summarized over and over again um, in, the, in the Occidental philosophies. Here is, is Descartes' interpretation of this uh, center in the brain. He used, he convened on the pineal <coughs> gland as an impair organ and thought that this is the place where all this takes place. Now, we now know that the brain is organized in a very different way. What you see here is uh, a side view of one of the hemispheres of the human brain, and all these different colored areas, they stand for distinct cortical areas that have very similar intrinsic organization, but subserve different functions because they are fed with different input signals. If the signals come, oops, if the signals come from the eye, um, visual impressions and visual percepts are generated if signals come from the ears, then auditory um, world is decoded and speech is decoded, for example. And in the more frontal regions, I unfortunately can't use that pointer. Well, no, it fades on the screen. Um, we have functions like planning for the future and storing uh, moral values and so forth. So many, many different areas, similar inter internal organization, so similar algorithms performed by each of these areas on different inputs. And they are connected, interconnected in a very, very complex way. What you see here, well, barely see here, um, you see red points that stand for the areas I have just been talking about. And they are linked with these white um, lines, and myriads of fiber connections that interconnect those 
areas of the cerebral cortex in a reciprocal way. So the prevailing principle of organization is parallelity. All these areas work in parallel. They are reciprocally connected. And we have a very, very flat hierarchy. It's not a uh, hierarchically organized system where input signals are processed serially until they come out at the other executive side as a motor program. No, the brain is um, a very distributed uh, system with a flat hierarchy. Um, what you just saw was a monkey brain, uh, but the same principle of organization prevails in the human brain. Here you see just a, a very um, sparse reproduction of connections in the human brain, determined in vivo now with the modern imaging technologies. And you see this, the same um, tish, tissue, uh, the same motive, it's parallelity and uh, reciprocity that prevails. Now, if one makes a, a Gedanken experiment and considers how such a system would react to um, an object that it perceives, uh, think of an object that can be seen, that can be touched, and that produces some noises. Such an object will activate myriads and myriads of neurons distributed in the various sensory areas, tactile, visual, and auditory, simultaneously, and these neurons extract certain features of this composite perceptual object. And at the same time, uh, the areas depicted on top of this figure, addressed as limbic, they add emotional connotations to this percept. They decide, they, well, they evaluate the object in terms of emotional connotations, whether it is something pleasant or something unpleasant, whether one should be afraid of it, and so forth. Question now arises, what is the representation of this concrete perceptual object? Um, and the answer is, um, it is a widely distributed cloud of activity to which myriads of neurons that are distributed in different centers of the brain contribute. And these neurons all interact with each other through these fibers that you see here. The connectivity is so dense that 70% of all possible connections between the nodes, nodes being either individual neurons or being cortical areas, are actually realized. Which means that if you want to come from any place in the brain, from any node in this network, to any other node, you can either go directly or at most you have to use one switching node in between. So it's an extremely densely interconnected network in which many, many processes occur simultaneously all the time. And there is no point, no localization, no, no, yeah, no single area where a perceptual object would be represented as such. It's always distributed, it's always a cloud of activity that is the neuronal correlate of a solid perceived object. Such distributed systems, they raise a number of problems and one of the most pertinent problem is the so-called binding problem. Imagine that there are more than one object in a scene that have to be kept separate. How can these respective clouds that code for the respective objects be segregated in such a highly interconnected system? They are superimposed, but they need to be segregated somehow. And how can communication be restricted to selected senders and receivers? Because you can't have everybody talk to everybody and listen to all the other neurons simultaneously in this highly interconnected system. Uh, it would be like tuning your receiver to all transmitter stations in the world. The result would be noise. So one solution of the binding problem is to encode semantic relations, so what goes with what, by establishing temporal relations to escape in time as a coding dimension. But this, of course, does require that neuronal activity has a temporal structure. If you want to use time in order to in code relations, you need temporal structure. Now, there is evidence that the brain activity is temporally structured. If one records from a cluster of neurons on the left side of this graph depicted and looks at the firing patterns when those neurons are activated appropriately, one most of the time realizes that they get activated synchronously and that they discharge periodically. 
And these oscillations that are usually recorded in the EEG in clinics, you see all those uh, very complex oscillatory patterns in the graphs. Um, they cover a very broad frequency range from 0.1 hertz all the way up to 200 hertz or so. And all these different frequencies, they have different functions. And the most fascinating aspect of these oscillations, which are a property of the microcircuits, the small circuits between excitatory and inhibitory neurons that tend to oscillate, is that they can synchronize. And they can synchronize over very large distances thanks to these reciprocal connections. So having synchrony, one can use this simultaneity in time as a signature of relatedness. It's very intuitive. If you have two events occurring simultaneously, you tend to bind them. If one precedes the other, you establish a causal relation. The brain very likely uses exactly the same uh, principle in order to solve the binding problem to define who is making common cause with whom at any one moment in time. And it appears in the moment as it, is a, as it would serve as a universal code for the expression of relations, both in cognitive and in executive functions. So the first paradigm shift then. Uh, we now see the brain as a very decentralized, self-organizing system rather than a hierarchically structured, stimulus-driven response machine. It generates its own activity. The microcircuits are oscillators, and they are coupled with each other. And we also have learned that particular functions are not localized somewhere in a particular area, but they are realized in the widely distributed networks that are dynamically configured by temporal coordination. So on the fly, on the backbone of the fixed anatomical connections, we call this network the connectome, um, the brain generates functional networks by synchronizing uh, the different oscillatory processes or making, making them coherent. So all the time you have a coexistence of coherent networks which may oscillate in different frequencies and thus be distinguished from each other. Now, this view has consequences with respect to our um, notion of disturbances, especially in psychiatric diseases. In the past, and most of the drugs that we are using have been discovered serendipitously about 50 years ago, um, seem to suggest, because of their efficiency, that we were treating a localized disorder of some neurotransmitter disequilibrium in some cortical areas, mainly prefrontal areas in schizophrenia. We have now, since these drugs don't really work well, and since they only address a sub-fraction of the symptoms in these diseases, um, that uh, this is probably not the pathophysiological mechanism that we should address in the future. Rather, it appears as if these brains had a severe problem in temporal coordination. Let me give you a few examples. Um, the, the task one asks patients is fairly simple. Uh, we show them black and white pictures like you see on the, on the left side and ask them, do you recognize a face or not? And then also pictures like on the right side, same question. And in order to recognize such a face, you need to invest a lot of binding functions, uh, retrieving information that is stored in the brain, using it in order to interpret the sparse signals that come in this case from the retina. And then analyze uh, brain activity using magnetoencephalography, for example, which gives high time resolution, very bad spatial resolution, but this is the only thing we have in the moment if you want to work with humans, and then see what happens. As you would expect, <clears throat> and these, all these green patches are sensors, uh, so you have about 240 sensors around this skull. Uh, squids work with uh, ultraconductive um, probes to measure very, very weak magnetic fields, and then you get these red spots which indicate there's activity in the areas where you expect them to find uh, the visual areas of the brain. Then what you do is, if you look for dynamics, um, you decompose the signals into frequency spectra. And what one sees is, in the upper graph, normal control persons, when they get these pictures presented and have to find out whether there's a face, so they do a pattern recognition task, about 
180 to 200 milliseconds after they have seen this pattern, they generate oscillatory activity in the visual areas in a particular frequency range. So the readiness indicates the amplitude of these oscillatory signals. In this case, they are at around 80 hertz. We call this the gamma frequency. If you do the same thing with patients, you already see the lower panel, there's much less of this uh, strong oscillatory activity. There's less power in this frequency range. But even more striking is if rather than just measuring the power, the amplitude of these oscillations, if you look for the phase coherence, the precision with which oscillations are synchronized across remote brain areas, you see that in the upper panel you have a, a nice reddish uh, dot at about the same time after presentation of the stimulus, meaning that uh, quite a number of uh, sites in this brain get synchronized with very high precision in this high frequency range of oscillations. While in the lower panel, this is patients, this is virtually absent. And this lack of precise synchronization, phase locking, correlates very, very closely to the severity of the psychological or psychiatric symptoms. One can then establish graphs um, depicting those areas that are synchronously active and linking them with uh, like lines. And this you see for normal persons in the upper panels. So there's a widespread network of synchronous activity emerging in normal subjects when they decode such a pattern. This is virtually lacking at the same threshold level in psychiatric patients. Suggesting that the inability to, pursue, to produce highly coherent, precisely synchronized activity over distance is one of the problems that these uh, patients have. And this goes very well with the symptomatology in schizophrenia, their inability of patients to bind what should be bound together semantically and to keep segregated what should be kept segregated. So there is good reason to believe that this disturbance is a, is a cause of the dissociative symptoms that we have in this disease. The change is so dramatic that it can, it can be used as a diagnostic tool. It's the first um, electrophysiological correlate um, of, of this disease. All the other uh, phenotype uh, can only be discovered post-mortem or is in very gross uh, anatomical analysis. Since much is known about the neuronal mechanisms that cause these oscillatory processes and which are responsible for the synchronization, one can now design completely different approaches for therapy. I have no time to go into it, but there's a whole new avenue. And Big Pharma now, interestingly enough, doesn't invest anymore in drug development, but rather in um, pushing this this system, system neuroscience approach because they think that this will open doors more easily than just trying more and more drugs. And this development has been strikingly unsuccessful over the last 50 years, probably because we were tracking the wrong hypothesis. Now, let me come to another aspect, um, novel computational algorithms that may be realized in the brain that we haven't been thinking of in the past. There are some mysteries um, suggesting that there's still something to be discovered here. Um, it is well established by now that if one, that perception is a constructive process whereby one capitalizes on an emo enormous amount of a priori knowledge that is stored in the architecture of the brain, knowledge that has been acquired during evolution and is through the genes installed in the architecture of the connectivity, and that is then, of course, during lifetime complemented by experience-dependent changes of this architecture, because every learning process changes the functional architecture, the coupling between neurons. So <clears throat> imagine for a moment that what you actually do, you usually change your gaze every 200 milliseconds, four times a second. And every time you can recognize something, on the fly, quickly, and usually very reliably, meaning that you have pulled out of the immense store of stored priors, of this reservoir of a priori knowledge, the right priors for the decoding of the particular sensory input that your eyes give you every 200 milliseconds. 
is fabulous if you think about the amount of information that must be stored there that you can pull out on the fly within a few hundred milliseconds. The same phenomenon, completely unexplained, is the holistic recall of stored memories. I give you a, a trigger word and it recalls a memory of your early childhood, La Madeleine de Proust, or a memory of last night. And they come up within a few hundred milliseconds and with astonishing precision, mostly. So also these, these incredibly large amount of memories that one stores over a lifetime must be somewhere and easily accessible with very short latency. And conversely, if asked something, you immediately know whether you know it or whether you don't know it. So you must have explored <laughs> your reservoir knowing it's not there. So this means all priors that we need for perception and all memories that we have stored, they are somewhere superimposed and equidistant to the search process. So this is a marvel. And the hypothesis is that such superposition of information can only be achieved in a very, very high dimensional space. No way to have lists that you serially search or so is done like it's done in computers. And the hypothesis is that the cerebral cortex, this in magic invention of uh, the evolution, and it must have been a very successful invention of evolution because since then nothing new has been evolved, just more of the same. So very successful invention is perhaps providing uh, the coding space for such high dimensional operations by capitalizing on the unique dynamic properties of recurrent networks. And I will el elaborate a little bit on that. And this suggests a very different computational approach that is very recent in informatics theory nowadays. Um, and there is now evidence that uh, recurrent networks, like we have them in the cerebral cortex, for example, made up of self-active nodes, preferentially, preferably by nodes that are able to oscillate, so have a network of coupled oscillators. Such networks are capable of producing very high dimensional dynamic states, and they have very powerful computational abilities. And now just a test, who, who has ever heard concepts of reservoir computing or liquid state computing in here? Ah, good, at least one. But I get the same score when I ask neuroscientists. Uh, it's something somehow better with computational people, but it's about the same with artificial intelligence people. So, about 10 years ago, uh, some pioneers have started to think about these recurrent networks. And let me give you a metaphor. Why is it called liquid computing or reservoir computing or eco-state computing? Imagine for a moment you have a pond of water and you throw a stone into that water. It produces a wave that propagates and slowly fades. So the water has a memory of this event that fades away after a while. Now one can show if one throws, throws in a sequence of stones, a big one here, a smaller one here, another one a little bit later there, <clears throat> this produces a very, very complex interference pattern of waves, very high dimensional pattern in this two dimensional surface, that will fade over time. And one can show, and this has also been done analytically, that it suffices to put three or four sensors into that pond that measure amplitude and phase of the waves and use this information to train um, a support vector machine, any linear classifier, fairly stupid elements. And they can learn about the sequence of events that had occurred and then re recover these patterns with very high re reliability, being able to generalize if something is missing, they complete it. They can um, even detect some invariance in these patterns. So it's a very powerful way to go about uh, the retrieval of information of sequences and complex patterns. So what the th throwing stones is nothing different than exciting a retina with, with patterns. So what is the advantage of this <laughs> slightly strange way of computing? Um, one is that the essence is that you transform a low dimensional input pattern into a very high dimensional state space. This is very good for categorization because in a high dimensional space you can segregate what normally would overlap 
in low dimensional space into very different corners. Then it's of course a very, very large space. The more dimensions you have, the more you can store in there. Which allows for the superposition of states uh, that are created by successive stimuli. And as I have already mentioned, one can then, through simple classifiers, extract invariant relations in this high dimensional space. And because of the fading memory that is determined by the viscosity of the liquid, uh, you have a memory function there, which allows you to, to keep track of sequences. And then it can be read out very easily by conventional linear classifiers. And there's a host of them available, and every neuron could be considered as such a classifier, actually. So, it doesn't take much fantasy to imagine that a neuronal network, as it is realized in the cerebral cortex, has such properties. It's, uh, made up of many nodes that oscillate, and they are recurrently coupled. So you get a system that is capable of generating a very, very high dimensional state spaces. And this is what it apparently does. And the question is then, are there any indications that evolution may have found that trick, that information theoreticians just are about to stumble, to, to, to discover now? So one can put this to an experiment. It, it is the very beginning of something that I predict would become a very important line of research. Uh, this can be tested. You show to an animal stimuli, A's, B's, C's, whatever, record from some of the nodes in this system, in these recurrently coupled networks, by putting electrodes in, sampling activity of these neurons, and then see whether you can decode from the activity of these neurons, from these high dimensional vectors, if you record from 50 neurons simultaneously, you have a 50-dimensional vector that evolves in time. Using a linear classifier, whether you can reconstruct what the animal or this network has actually been seen before. So this is how it goes. Um, you record from these neurons with electrodes, and it's not easy to see, but uh, you see here raster grams with 50 lines. So each of these lines corresponds to a neuron, each of the black dots dot to a discharge, and you show to the retina a sequence of letters that are covered by the response areas of these neurons, and then you, um, you train a classifier, uh, tell him what you now see in this moment of time corresponds to an A, and then you train another classifier for a B, and so on. And then you see whether you can retrieve information out of that system, having randomly selected some of these nodes, so it's not no purpose in that. So you can't see anything, so I will describe to you what, this, what, you, what you actually get if you do this. You find that if you show a stimulus, A, um, and then you wait, you can retrieve the information about the stimulus up to a second after it had disappeared, just from the ongoing evolving activity in this network. If you give two stimuli in a, in a sequence, you can determine after the second stimulus has appeared what the first stimulus was and what the second was, with a probability of up to 90%, um, which is very high, given that you undersample the nodes of this network dramatically because there are millions of neurons and you only take 60 of them. Still, you can do it. So this means this network has a memory, it's fading, it has the ability to superimpose information of very different stimuli on top of each other, and they remain decodable. And this is possible because of the high dimensionality of that system. Then it has a few other charming properties. Um, and usually these properties are discovered by chance. Uh, we saw that if we repeat stimuli frequently, our classifiers do better and better and better, suggesting that the network has learned in an unsupervised way about the statistics of these stimuli and creating for them reserved corners in this high dimensional uh, sp space so that they can more easily be categorized. For the specialists, uh, if you do a principal component analysis on these vectors, you see that with time, um, the red dots and the green dots and the black dots, they segregate, indicating that the network has orthogonalized the representations of these stimuli. <coughs> nice property. And then one can go even 
one step further, train classifiers to reconstruct the brightness value of the patterns that have been shown before and use these in order to look into the ongoing activity of the network. So during phases where you do nothing, the animal has seen Fs, As, Bs and Ds and then you give it a rest, it can have a nap in between and then look at the spontaneous activity that is produced by these networks. And to a great surprise, but predicted from this theory, um, after the network has learned about those patterns, it replaced them. So the spontaneous activity that is generated by these many, many neurons actually groups itself, self-organizes into interpretable patterns. So as you see in this, in this slide here, uh, all of a sudden, for a period of about 100 milliseconds, it replaced the one. And then a little bit later, it replaced the E. Then it replaced some nonsense. And then if activated with a concrete C, afterwards it replaced the C as it should. So I won't go further into detail here, but give you an outlook. As it stands in the moment, it's very likely that the brain exploits um, this strategy, which means um, it is able to create an extremely high dimensional state space for storing information and performing computations in this high dimensional space for which we have no intuition. We cannot imagine such, at least I can't, mathematicians probably can. Um, but it can also be predicted that we shall have a very hard time to investigate these high dimensional dynamic processes because we tend to undersample them and because virtually all analytical tools that we apply in the moment, uh, they have been designed to capture stationary activity in uh, linear, low dimensional um, dynamical systems. So we need a lot of effort in the moment and we need close cooperation with our colleagues, mathematicians and physicists who have partly developed methods that we now need to apply in order to cope with these very complex high dimensional dynamics that apparently evolution has implemented um, without us knowing. Um, and it has epistemic implications also. Um, if evolution has really implemented such computational strategies, it actually found a way to realize in a classical system what quantum computers are expected to achieve. This is exactly what they would like to have. Superimpose a lot of information in wave functions and then retrieve it by, by collapse. But we work in the classical system. The brain is too warm, too soft, too big. Uh, so no quantum physics there. Um, so I can either leave it here, depending on my chairman and the time, Yeah, um, that would just give me an, to answer the, to my original title. <laughs> um, as, you, as you may know, there is a very active field in neuroscience now, and this is to look for the neuronal correlate of consciousness. A few decades ago, this has been considered not serious. Now we are doing it. And there are essentially two competing hypotheses. One is that one assumes that there is a particular area in the brain whose activation is um, the correlate of a conscious experience. Now, this can probably be crossed out already. As you have seen, there is no such area. It's a distributed system. And the competing hypothesis, which is the, the more likely one, is that um, the condition required to be conscious of something is a particular dynamic state, a particular state of large distributed networks. So the hypothesis that are generated in this dynamical um, theory is that um, conscious processing of information is correlated with long distance neural synchrony such as you have seen it in, in the healthy subjects uh, that, we had, that I showed you. While uh, just subconscious processing which is a, most of what we process is subconscious, so consciousness is only a small part. Um, that would be accomplished by local processes that uh, also f form networks, but by and large not as extended as those required for conscious experience. And there's evidence for it. If one um, 
examine subjects um, that process information, in one case consciously and in the other case subconsciously. In both cases, information is processed all the way down to the semantic level. One finds that if it, information is processed consciously, if subjects can report about it, um, they always generate at some stage of the processing large distributed networks that are coherently active, while in case of subconscious processing this does not occur. So that fits quite well with the hypothesis. So it seems that we have a neuronal correlate for conscious processing, but this does not solve the hard problem. And the hard problem in consciousness research is how one should conceive of the phase transition between neuronal processes and the immaterial nature of subjective experience, the qualia, our sensations, immaterial entities. And the question I would like to put forward to discussion for discussion is whether the hard problem could be softened if we consider the embedding of brains in their social cultural environment and if we consider consciousness as a social reality, as something that exists only because of brains interact with each other. So I'm taking you into the newly evolving domain of social neurosciences where we get away from the analysis of individual brains and we get more interested in the cooperation of systems of coupled brains, if you like, so the next network level. So what are social realities? These are immaterial phenomena resulting from social interactions and they were absent in the pre-cultural world. They are not perceivable with the natural senses, obviously, because they have evolved for the pre-cultural world. And they are commonly associated with mental or spiritual or immaterial dimensions. And here are examples, empathy, fairness, greed, love, devotion, norms, belief systems, moral imperatives. All these entities which are concrete and they have effect because a belief erected cathedrals, they are immaterial and they exist only because brains endowed with the cognitive abilities of human brains interacted with each other and made these attributions. Uh, monkeys don't have all this. Mowgli doesn't know about it. He may be conscious, but he doesn't know about it. So consciousness has much of these connotations. And um, the idea would be that one could soften the hard problem by considering consciousness as a cultural attribution, so as a social reality. Because in that case, the analysis of individual brains would not explain consciousness. It would only reveal the mechanism required for the creation of social realities and hence, among other things, also consciousness. And this is very different. So certain attributes of consciousness do indeed have the status of social realities, as these would not exist without social interactions. So the concept of mental causation or agency or aesthetic judgments and even the qualia, they would not exist had brains not mirrored each other and attributed these qualities to their sensations. So the proposal would be that the immaterial connotations of consciousness cannot be accounted for by the material processes within individual brains alone. These are the necessary prerequisites, but they cannot fully account for it. Which does not mean that consciousness would not be amenable to naturalistic interpretations because one can consider brains as nodes in a social network and therefore consciousness as an emerging social reality. So you see the step from one network to the next network level. And I found it quite amazing that there is an analogy with the neuronal representation of concrete cognitive objects. Because as I told you when alluding to those clouds, they are also immaterial relational constructs. There are nodes in the brain, material neurons, they talk to each other, but what makes the gist of a, of a cognitive content is a relational construct that cannot be touched and that has no defined locus in space. So with this, I would like to conclude and hope that I could share at least some of the excitement about these new developments in neuroscience, which I think get us far beyond the behaviorist stance where we looked at the brain as, as a 19th century mechanism. And in, in the light of these new data, 
the word determinism becomes a, gets a, becomes a completely different not, not a connotation. It's no longer something menacing and um, making us feel like machines. No, uh, in such complex nonlinear dynamics, uh, the notion of determinism has a much more charming connotation. And this is what I would leave you with. Thank you. Thank you.